cloud is the cloud. All right, so we got biodiversity today and conservation. And so we've been really dancing around the idea of biodiversity all semester. I basically gave you the definition the first day in class. Um, and so you sort of, we sort of have a general idea of biodiversity, but we're going to get a more nuanced definition today, more in-depth definition today. And the question we're going to try to answer, um, I don't have any quotes for today. Um, I couldn't find a good quote about biodiversity that I liked. Uh, but the question we're going to try to answer today, um, outside of the fact that these polar bears are absolutely adorable. I mean, look at this guy. Look at this one. They're so little chunky, guys. Um, why should we protect a polar bear? Why is one species important? Why do we care about this one species, right? When we think about climate change and the effects of climate change, polar bears are always brought up as a species that's heading towards extinction. So why do we care about a single species? And if that species isn't human, why, why do we care? So we're gonna try to answer that question today. Keep this in the back of your mind as we're going through things. We'll loop back and talk about it at the end of class. Um, get your opinions, see what you guys think. So let's, um, let's get a more rigorous definition of biodiversity. So as we spoke about biodiversity breaks down as life and diversity you guys know right diversity how many different things we have right so if you think about humans if we have a very diverse group of humans we have someone from england someone from china someone from japan india and so on and so forth right that's what we mean by diversity but when we apply it to a species or to or i should say towards nature we think about it in three distinct contexts so the first one we've already discussed is how many different types of species do we have? If I have 100 species, we would say that's high biodiversity. It's also sometimes called richness, species, species richness. Um, you'll see that um, as you sort of peruse through readings and stuff like that. Uh, lots of species is called high species richness as well. Uh, so that's the one we sort of already defined. Now, it is a bit more nuanced to that. Now, within a single species, and I think the human sort of population shows this really nicely, there's a vast reservoir of genetic diversity as well. So every human on the planet, um, regardless of how different we look from one another, is all part of the same genus species, Homo sapiens, right? That's our genus species. So given that, we can look at how different we all look. Uh, usually this is easier when I have you guys look around the classroom, um, but even if I had you guys look at each other's videos, there's lots of black screen, so it's, it's not as effective uh, of a tool when we're on, the Zoom, on Zoom, but you guys know when you head out into Boston, when you head out to any large city, um, it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable diversity of traits, right? Skin colors, heights, weights, eye color, skin tones, whatever you can think of, that's the genetic diversity we're talking about a large diversity of traits. And again, that's not just a human thing. That's also a thing for elk and cows and sheep and any, any animal you can think of, including bacteria, including viruses, everything you can think of, there's monstrous amounts of genetic diversity out there. I just put this in one last sort of perspective that um, will get you thinking a little bit more about what genetic diversity means. When they say different strains of COVID, that's the genetic diversity we're thinking about, right? We have the Delta variant of COVID and the Alpha variant of COVID, right? That's just genetic diversity within COVID as a virus. So, um, and it's also sort of an underlooked aspect of, of, of um, diversity as well, um, just, as a, just as a note. Um, when people think about biodiversity, this is sort of the last thing they think about. And then finally, we'll, uh, we, we went really, really small. We went to the molecular level here. Then we went to the level you can see. Uh, and then we'll finish off by talking about what our final level of biodiversity, and it's the ecosystem level. Um, as we discussed, uh, the Earth has different ecosystems depending on where you are. And remember, an ecosystem is an interplay between the living and the non-living, right? Rocks and squirrels, right? The a river and trout, right? That's that's what an ecosystem is. But within a given sort of region, um, if we have a bunch of different types of ecosystems, this is simply what we would call ecosystem diversity, and it is in itself a metric of biodiversity. Now you might ask yourself, why is ecosystem diversity a metric of biodiversity? Well, the reality is, if you have lots of different habitats, as we sort of see here, we have grasslands and forests and shields and foothills. Those all have different conditions, right? Different environmental conditions or what we would call abiotic conditions. And because of that, it invites more species diversity and more biodiversity as a whole. So really ecosystem diversity fosters more genetic diversity as well as biodiversity. So it is an important aspect of diversity as a sort of way to think about the environment. So um, 
And um, clearly, um, all of these things have the capacity to be affected by humans, right? We can in, we can eliminate ecosystem diversity by harvesting this boreal forest, right? We could uh, build a park here, right? We, we can change this level. We can change biodiversity by, say, overfishing, right? We can also change genetic diversity by overfishing as well, right? So we have the capacity as humans to change biodiversity at all levels. Now, as we've mentioned, uh, ecosystem services, they're super duper valuable, right? Trillions of dollars on a yearly basis provided to the economy free of charge uh, here and abroad, obviously. But really, and we sort of didn't quite get, I didn't really put this idea out there at the time, but I sort of alluded to it. But the idea that what really underpins ecosystem services is biodiversity. So when we talked about provisioning services, you can't have healthy provisioning services without biodiversity. You can't have regulating services, you can't have cultural services, and you can't have the sort of the, the sort of the backbone services that ecosystems provide without biodiversity. So biodiversity gives us ecosystem services, thus giving us economic value of the ecosystems that we think about. So Whenever we lose species, we potentially lose ecosystem services. So if we think back to our example of the, of the Florida Everglades, where we lose it, we, were, we talked about the Florida Everglades, we changed the water flow, we lost two vibrant fisheries, the bonefish and the tarpon fisheries. We lost biodiversity in those fish, and we also lost the, reg, the provisioning services that those fish provided for us, in addition to the relatively large economic value of that fishery to the state of Florida. So again, these ecosystem services, super important, not just for you, but you know, agriculture, business, whatever, but it is solely underpinned by biodiversity. And again, biodiversity at all three levels. Changing this all to one type of, of ecosystem reduces this, reduces this, thus reduces the ecosystem services that this area could potentially provide. So kind of a cool um, link, right? I, I think this class links really well to that um, ecosystem services class, really thinking about um, what gives ecosystems value. Because again, it is really the, the organisms living there that do it. If there was no life, <laughs> there would frankly be no ecosystem value, right? So we can ask the question next, um, and I think it's a good question to ask, where is biodiversity found? And the reality of it is, is actually just everywhere. Um, I hope when you guys survey your backyards and your backyard biodiversity lab, I hope you realize how species rich you, where, you, where you are is, right? So I live in Massachusetts, south of Boston. Even I know when I go to my backyard, there's dozens and dozens of species living out there that I can see and many, many, many more that I can't see. So biodiversity is all around us from the top of the atmosphere all the way down to the bottom ocean of the oceans. Biodiversity is everywhere. Which is kind of a cool thing. Can't escape biodiversity, which is which is a good thing. However, there is what we call uh, biodiversity hotspots. Now, biodiversity hotspots. Well, I'll show you a map of some hotspots in a moment. Uh, but they're basically areas where biodiversity is uh, relatively um, extra. Uh, I'm sorry, really, relatively increased relative to say normal biodiversity in a comparable area. And so you can ask yourself, why are biodiversity hotspots more diverse than other areas? And they actually have a high amount of what we call endemism. And endemism um, is actually, uh, you only have, is when a species is only found in that one area. So we actually talked about an endemic species already. We talked about the Florida manatee when we talked about the Florida Everglades. And I told you guys to Google uh, manatee flippers because you can see their little fingernails still. Um, I always find that cool. Um, but you see the manatee here, it's only, this species of manatee is only found in Florida, in the Everglades, thus it is endemic to the Florida Everglades. So given that, you could imagine the Florida Everglades is a biodiversity hotspot, and you would be absolutely correct. Um, so biodiversity hotspots are found everywhere. And so this is just a handy dandy map where we have terrestrial hotspots here and uh, in like pinkish, orange, salmon, whatever color you wanna call it. And then we have marine biodiversity hotspots in blue. You'll notice that there's quite a few biodiversity hotspots um, on the land, um, not so much in the ocean, um, not very much at all. Uh, but does anybody see any uh, patterns to this data? Um, I mean, it's not really data, but does anybody see any patterns in this map that you think is interesting?
Well, if I were to have you look in the Pacific Ocean, what's going on over here? I got one person in the chat. Okay, so coasts seem to be a hot spot. That's good. Um, the near the equator, that's also a good thing. Uh, Nicholas, what do you have to say? I mean, the terrestrial biodiversity and then the marine is like, they're, they're pretty close to each other. They seem to be related. Yeah. Yeah, so we got a couple good things. Lots of along the coasts. You're absolutely right about that. Um, lots of it near the equator, so tropical areas. Um, I'm sorry, so I saw someone raise their hand, but it went away on me. Um, Abdullah? Yeah, Professor, um, I raised my hand. Yep. I was just also going to try and point out that um, I think that, like, all of the, I think that, like, a really important point is, is to talk about the climate here, like, because I feel like all of, like, the orange spots are, are in relatively, you know, hot climates. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, that's, that's definitely true. They're all near the equator, so they're all warm. And as we discussed, the equator gets constant sunlight throughout the year. Thus, it has a pretty consistent climate year round. And it's sort of this, this, sort of this cool thing. The more consistent the climate, the, the more biodiversity there is. It's kind of a cool thing. So actually, interesting enough, as you go north and south away from the equator, biodiversity gets less and less and less. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, so we got uh, stable climate. We got the equator, warm temperatures, um, lots of things on the coast. Anything else? Anything else you guys see? Well, the one thing that I'm surprised, no, someone always gets this one, is um, oh, one person got it, I hope. Mostly islands, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point, Megan. Yeah, that's the sort of the one last thing I wanted to make mention of. Lots and lots of islands, and, and it's really highlighted by Madagascar, um, our own Caribbean islands here, all throughout the Pacific, as well as, you know, the Indian, Indo-Asian islands here. Lots of biodiversity on islands. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so lots of biodiversity on islands, lots of biodiversity in the equator, lots of biodiversity in stable, warm climates. Pretty cool. Um, so good job. Um, the other thing I just wanted to make mention of is, um, and just to sort of think back uh, to our last class, or no, the last class, so anyway, one of our previous classes where we were talking about population biology, lots of, lots of biodiversity hotspots near the coast. And remember, humans like to settle near the coast. And so we're living oftentimes in biodiversity hotspots, right? So think about how many people live in this part of California, right? How many people live in this part of Florida? How many hundreds of millions of people live in Brazil, right? So thinking about this sort of humans like biodiversity hotspots. So it's kind of a, kind of a, a wild thing. Lots of biodiversity hotspots, lots of biodiversity on islands. Does anybody have a, any idea why islands might sort of invite biodiversity? It's a kind of a hard question. So I don't, I don't, I don't even if you have a, a thought, it's always good. Yeah, so they're so they're secluded. They definitely have uh, land, water, lots of animals. But yeah, one of the big things is they're actually secluded. Um, when something gets secluded, it invites all sorts of um, unique innovations to respond to living on an island because it's much much harder to live on an island than it is to live on the mainland. So good, 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 good. All right, so. That's biodiversity. That's where it's found globally, but there are hotspots and we love as a population to live near those hotspots. So you can clearly see there's some overlap between biodiversity and where humans like to live. So let's define some definitions and, and we could do this actually with a really successful um, piece of legislation. Um, and this is um, the United States Endangered Species Act. Uh, it was enacted in 1973. And so we'll define an endangered species as something that is in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant proportion of its range. And that's one aspect of the endangered species list. You could be uh, any different types of endangered. And then the sort of the, the more um, 
the, the, the better part of being on the endangered species list is the threatened species part, which basically is defined as a species uh, is likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. So I'll give you, I have two examples here. <clears throat> we have the vaquita. Um, I love this picture of the vaquita. Um, they're, I mean, it's, they're really critically endangered. There's like 50 of them left in the world. But I love this picture of this vaquita, um, even though it's dead, because it looks like it's just like smirking. Uh, I mean, just look at that face. He's just, he's just smirking. Um, critically endangered uh, marine mammal. And then we have um, an example of the West Indian manatee found obviously in uh, the Indo-Pacific islands. Uh, it is threatened as a species. So. The Endangered Species Act um, adopted in the United States, um, it's not like a, a global thing. It's not through the United Nations or anything like that, but a lot of countries have followed suit um, with the United States. Um, and the United States did base their laws on some other countries' laws as well. But uh, most countries across the planet um, have some level of protection for endangered species similar to the Endangered Species Act. So. Now, <clears throat> to date, uh, the Endangered Species Act, or the ESA, protects about 1,600, 1,650 in that ballpark, endangered or threatened plant and animal species. Now, just highlight, um, I mean, that sounds like a lot, right? But just to just sort of put this in perspective, there's about 1.2 million species on the planet. So 1,600 of them are on the Endangered Species Act. Um, that's not a huge proportion, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, but the, the Endangered Species Act is actually really, really successful. Um, it's actually one of the few environmental policies that has a ridiculously high success rate. Because um, as we talked about, ecosystems are, are, are dynamic. So you know, protecting things is oftentimes hard, but this act was really good. Now, about 99% of the species placed on this endangered species list have actually not gone extinct, which is pretty remarkable. Um, <clears throat> um, if you think about it, right? Uh, just by putting them on this list, it affords them a numerous amounts of protections, which keeps them from going extinct. Um, and, and as we'll sort of discuss, once something is extinct, like say the passenger pigeon, it is gone forever. So the Danish Species Act, really, really important. Now, um, in 2019, um, so during the last presidential administration here, um, there was some pretty severe weakening of the Endangered Species Act, um, not set forth by Congress or anything like that, but set forth by the president. Um, and uh, I like this quote from the New York Times because it describes really well what, what um, the previous administration has done. It says, for the first time, regulators would be allowed to conduct economic assessments, for instance, estimating lost revenue from a prohibition of logging in a critical habitat when deciding whether a species warrants protection. And I hope you guys can see that's just a silly thing to do, right? Um, for many reasons, but if you're trying to, if the purpose of an act is to protect species, you should protect the species because they need to be protect, protected, not because a logging company might lose a few million dollars, right? So the, the, that sort of change in the policy is pretty at odds at the purpose of the Endangered Species Act. Um, the other thing that happened, um, that, and this is actually still going on, is that species that are characterized as threatened actually no longer receive the same protections as species that are considered endangered. That was one of the cool things about the Endangered Species Act. If you were threatened, you were afforded all the protections that something endangered was receiving. So it was a really important thing to sort of maintaining threatened species and keeping threatened species from becoming endangered. Um, and the other thing that was some pretty severe changes in um, language about how we talk about the foreseeable future, i.e. like when, like what time frames do we have to talk about something becoming endangered or becoming extinct? Uh, it really essentially extended it out. Um, or I'm sorry, they, I'm sorry, really, really brought it in. It had to be like, it's going to go extinct within a couple of years as opposed to it will go extinct within a decade. So. Lots of um, hampering to the Endangered Species Act, which again has been very, very successful. Um, but I will say this first point was actually rolled back by the by the Biden administration, which is good. Um, but these other two remain in some way, shape, or form. But they are not as um, thankfully they're not as detrimental as they used to be. So the Endangered Species Act, very, very successful, but has depending on the administration, um, some pretty severe limitations can be placed on it. Now, the Endangered Species Act, as we mentioned, has been very, very successful at keeping things going extinct. And extinction just means when something is no longer found on the planet at all. And so I gave you the example of the, the, the sea cow. Uh, I'm sorry, the sea cow. <laughs> I'm sorry, looking at my picture of the stellar sea cow, but uh, that is another species that has gone extinct here. Um, we have the stellar sea cow here, but I gave you the example of the, of the passenger pigeon um, when we talked about the tragedy of the commons. 
that's a species that is extinct, right? It's no longer found on planet Earth. Uh, but there's many, many examples of this. Um, you know, if you guys, if you guys have ever watched like Ice Age, every every animal in Ice Age has gone extinct, right? The saber tooth tiger, the woolly mammoth, right? Um, but you can also think of things that happened, you know, relatively recently, like the dodo bird and and um, you know the white rhino is just about to go extinct. So lots of species can potentially be lost. And this quote is really, uh, really sort of um, hits home uh, that when something goes extinct, it's forever. There, that that uh, biodiversity is lost forever. But if there's something is endangered. Uh, you could still have time to potentially um, save that organism. Now, there is another term that you'll see quite often is extirpation, uh, where a species that is, say, normally found in Canada and all throughout Central and South America is pushed out of one area of its natural range. So, for instance, the pygmy short horn lizard here, uh, looking, looking uh, I don't know, a little bit evil here with his mouth open, trying to thermoregulate. Uh, it was extirpated from Canada due to a variety of reasons, um, but is no longer found in Canada, only found in Central and in, in, uh, United States, Central America and the United States. So that's an example of extirpation. Now, a more local example of extirpation is actually the rattlesnake. The Eastern, the eastern rattlesnake uh, used to be found in Massachusetts in the Boston area, um, but because people didn't want rattlesnakes in a heavily populated area, we actually locally extirpated rattlesnakes from the eastern part of Massachusetts. So you really don't find rattlesnakes in eastern Massachusetts anymore, really only found in western Massachusetts. Um, though I will say, um, people that like, if you've ever been to the Blue Hills in um, Milton and Quincy and Randolph, some people swear you can still find rattlesnakes there. But for all intents and purposes, um, the rattlesnakes have been extirpated from eastern Massachusetts. So pretty, um, Pretty, um, uh, I don't know, I guess a pretty cool local story. But again, extinction, gone forever, extirpation, I just kicked you out of your home, or at least part of your home, I should say. Okay, so what is the current state of um, biodiversity? Um, so there was a very, very large report uh, in 2019 called the Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is put forth by the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity. So it's just another one of those NGOs that we talked about. Um, there were some pretty key findings, um, and I think this quote from Robert Watson really, um, really, really hits the point home. It says the decline in biodiversity is eroding the foundations of our economies, livelihoods, food security, health, and quality of life worldwide. And I think that really says all I would technically need to say, but I'm going to talk about some um, important aspects of this report in just a second. But um, it should really put forth the idea that global biodiversity as a whole is declining. And it's declining not because it's a natural thing, it's declining because of human or anthropogenic activities. So we are currently in the middle of our, our sort of one of our uh, great biodiversity loss events um, currently. So let's talk about some of the things that we, um, that we found from this report, because they are pretty, um, they are pretty important. Now, depending on who you ask, there's about 1.4 to 1.8 million species that have been scientifically identified um, on planet Earth. Now, what does that mean? It means a scientist found them and gave them a genus species name. Um, you know, like our genus species name is Homo sapiens, right? So for something to get that, that genus species name, a scientist has to discover it, characterize it, and then give it a species name. So that's what it means when we say we have 1.4 to 1.8 million species. However, the reality of that number is it's actually likely an underestimate. We actually think there's probably closer to about four to six million species on this planet. We just simply haven't discovered them yet. And you might ask yourself, how haven't we discovered species? Well, jungles of the Amazon, of, of the sub-Saharan Africa, the, the, the deep parts of the ocean, there's untold life in those parts that we just have not found yet because it's hard. It's hard to find new species. So we have a lot of species, but there's a lot of species that we simply have not found yet. So you might, you might, you might sort of think like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I would absolutely agree with you that that's really cool. There's species that are not known to science. But the reality is if we don't know about those species, we can't protect them, right? We can't give them endangered species protections, right? If they're undiscovered, that means they could disappear before we ever ever find them. So kind of a kind of an amazing thing, but also a little bit scary at the same time from a from a biodiversity perspective, of course. Now, um, 
globally, if there's this many species, about 1.4 to 1.8 that have been identified, we think there's about 1 million planted animal species that are headed towards um, extinction. They're headed towards um, being on that endangered species list. And so remember, we set that endangered species list right now as about 1,600. Could you imagine how big that list is going to be as we progress, as we lose more and more biodiversity going forward? That's not very, that's a list of like, I feel like it's, if you have a million things threatened with extinction, it's easier to make a list of things that are not threatened with extinction, right? Um, as, as nihilistic as that is. So that's the big takeaway. Global biodiversity is declining in plants, in animals, in fish, in arthropods, insects, whatever you can think of, it is declining by at the, at the global level. So that's the main takeaway. And again, this quote from Robert Watson really hammers home that point. Now, the other thing we're seeing is about 82% of wild mammalian biomass is gone. Now, what does that mean? Well, it just simply means there's 82% less animals out there, less squirrels, less, um, uh, you know, like African animals, like lions and tigers and all, and all that stuff. 82% of that is simply gone. And interestingly, uh, when we actually look at... Um, if we sort of look at all mammalian biomass on the planet, 96% of all mammalian biomass is actually just found in humans and our farm animals. So only 4% of all mammalian biomass is wild animal biomass. Globally, 40% of amphibians, um, most of it occurring in the tropics, but still a lot of it occurring here in the United States is threatened with extinction. Uh, if you might ask yourself, why are amphibians um, threatened with extinction? There's a really nasty fungus that humans are spreading called chytrid that is killing our amphibian populations worldwide. Um, that could be a whole class on itself, so I won't dive any more into it, but the fungus is called chytrid, C-H-Y-T-R-I-D, if you're interested in frogs and salamanders and things like that. Uh, globally, we know half of corals have disappeared since the 19th century, and as I sort of alluded to in the, the water section, corals support huge amounts of, of fish biomass, uh, which provides a huge food source for about, about um, two-sevenths of the world's population, so about one-third of the population of the planet. Uh, we've lost about a, uh, we, we're, we have about a third of our marine mammals are threatened with extinction. Um, so we, I showed you the vaquita, I showed you the manatee. There's many, many more species out there that are threatened with extinction. And actually, this number is wrong. Um, There's actually a recent report that actually showed this number is closer to 40%. I forgot to update the slide. About 40% of insects globally are threatened with extinction. And again, you might not think that's a big deal. You might not like insects, and that's okay. But do know insects are really, really important to the functioning of ecosystems, and they make up most of the sort of living material in an ecosystem. So if insects go bye-bye, the ecosystems go along with it. So I, I, know, I know it's an exciting prospect to think, oh, there'll be no more mosquitoes, but that would be a very bad thing. So, all right. So let's, um, <clears throat> that's our, um, our status of biodiversity. It's grim. It really is. So just to sort of tell you where we're at, we are currently given all this in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction on this planet. You might ask yourself, what defines a mass extinction? Well, a mass extinction is simply defined as the potential or the uh, capacity to lose 25% of all species. And you might ask yourself, when's the last mass extinction? And you guys already know the answer to this question because everyone loves dinosaurs. And if you don't, if you say you don't love dinosaurs, I don't believe you. Uh, everyone loves dinosaurs. And the last great mass extinction was 65 million years ago, and it wiped out our dinosaur friends and about 50% of life on the planet. So we are in a very, very, very dire state. That's that's where we're at. Biodiversity is globally not in a good position. And again, biodiversity underpins ecosystem functions. So without biodiversity or a loss of biodiversity, we start to erode away our ecosystem functions, the services that they provide, and in turn, start to erode our economies, our livelihoods. And so as I sort of mentioned in the population biology class, one of the things we think is going to most heavily limit human population growth going forward is how much environmental degradation there is, right? And that really gets back to the changing biodiversity problem. So... <clears throat> With that grim stuff out of the way, let's talk about more grim stuff. <laughs> uh, a lot of the stuff we talk about in this class is doom and gloom, unfortunately, uh, and that's just the, sort of the, the state of environmental science at most times. But let's talk about the IUCN list. Um, it's a pretty important list, so it's the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, <clears throat> 
it's um, basically a guide um, to revise international agreements, um, including the uh, international, sorry, the Convention on Trade in Endangered Species or CITES Act. Uh, it's also sort of part of the UN's Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, and so it's a global group of people that provides, um, or I should say a, a, a institute uh, that provides data on species um, health, allowing them to sort of very much like the Endangered Species Act, but at a global level, put things on this list. And it ranges from extinct, extinct in the wild. So you could think of like uh, things that are only alive in zoos, but are extinct in the wild, things that are critically endangered, endangered, and then that vulnerable. And so vulnerable is sort of, um, we've already mentioned what that is, like it's heading towards being endangered. And uh, then we have sort of things that are least threatened and least concerned, like they're getting to the point of being vulnerable. Uh, things that are of least concern are things that are like, we don't really think there's any change, like squirrels, for instance, are of least concern. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting. Um, the IUCN list is pretty pervasive, but if you've ever like wanted to know about a species and you went to Wikipedia, it will give its IUCN status, um, just, just as a note. So if you are interested uh, about any IUCN status, you can visit their website or you can also check Wikipedia because Wikipedia does incorporate this. So <clears throat> that's the IUC list. We'll come back to this in just a moment. Uh, but I want to just sort of come back to the idea of ec the economy and biodiversity. As we've mentioned, biodiversity underpins ecosystem uh, services. And the reality of it is um, we're thinking, when we start to think about sort of what this biodiversity loss means in global economics, um, economists estimate that biodiversity loss in Europe just in Europe, nowhere else on the planet, is estimated to, to cost about 3% of the EU's GDP per year. And so that's not a huge fraction, right? I mean, 3% is not very much, but again, it's still lost GDP, uh, GDP that potentially never will come back just because of the way we treat nature. Now, uh, in addition, um, global biodiversity loss, um, we estimate by, um, by about um, 2050, will total the, the total um, global economy about $15 trillion per year. So we're talking about no joke sums of change here, right? Uh, you know, 3% of GDP is small, but global by 2050, talking about trillions of dollars per year. And that is, that is no joke um, in terms of a loss to the economy. You know, that's basically like losing the entire uh, Chinese economy, right, from the from the face of the planet, right? And, and China is the second biggest economy on the planet. So again, this is no no joke. Now, what are the, what is the economics for protecting species globally? Well, protecting all the world's threatened species, uh, we estimate would cost between four and seventy six billion dollars. It depends on who you ask. Um, it's it's or it depends how the math is done. So clearly, not a huge chunk of change, right? Four billion dollars is for at least in the, on the global stage is basically nothing. And even $76 billion is still only 10% of say our military budget on a yearly basis. So it's not a lot of money to protect a huge sum of money, right? And that's one thing I hope you guys really take away from this class is protecting the environment is not super expensive and it has some huge rewards at the back end and they're not mutually exclusive. So let's talk about how, um, Let's talk about how we can sort of value this. And we'll talk about uh, two distinct types of ecosystems here. Uh, we have a, a mangrove. Um, mangroves are really cool. They're forests. They're basically on stilts. They exist in the, uh, the Caribbean as well as in Asia. Um, but they're, they're pretty well known in, um, you guys have ever been to Puerto Rico or uh, the Dominican Republic. Those are well known ecosystems in those areas of the world. Um, so really cool ecosystems. Now. There are coastal ecosystems, so they do provide uh, a lot of coastal protection. So they provide protection against storm surge as well as erosion. Uh, and that totals at about $3,000 per hectare per year. So no $3,000 per hectare. And remember, a hectare is about two and a half acres. So just by existing, right? That's that's what we're talking about here. They're not like, you know, they're, they're, they're ecosystems, right? They're not like doing anything, right? They're just existing. So 3,800 bucks a year just to protect our coasts. Uh, their fish reserves that they, they provide because uh, mangroves are great fishery, uh, fish nurseries, uh, provide about $70 per hectare per year to local fisheries. And their forest products, i.e. when you cut a, a mangrove tree down, you can sell it for, again, 
about $90 per hectare per year. So they provide both um, regulating services as well as provisioning services at a value of, of, of about $4,000 per hectare. Now that's in relative to a shrimp farm. So something that is directly a provisioning service. Uh, and you'll see that the profits from shrimps is about $200 per hectare. And that's not a lot of money for a hectare, right? Especially relative to the $4,000 here for a mangrove. Now, the reality is there's also direct and indirect costs here. So there's direct costs to the, to the shrimp farmers where they have to take care of their pollution as well as direct costs to the state or the country where a fish farm is. And you have to clean up pollution. And that's a net drain of about $230 per hectare per year. A shrimp farm also as every aspect of our agriculture is, whether it's aquaculture, uh, growing cows or growing corn, everything is subsidized um, by federal governments worldwide. And so that subsidies come out to about $1,700 per hectare per year for a shrimp farm. So I hope this sort of, this, this really this stark dichotomy of a, a good healthy ecosystem versus an ecosystem that's strictly for provisioning services are really in, in pretty strong diametric opposition here where shrimp farms, they're not worth very much. And the same could be said about soybean farms or corn farms. They're not simply worth as much as a natural ecosystem. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have farms because obviously we have to have farms, but when we're thinking about biodiversity, protecting biodiversity, biodiversity and keeping ecosystems intact is extremely valuable, right? And I think this $15.5 trillion per year by 2050 really hammer homes, hammer, hammer homes that point. Um, again, really valuable. Biodiversity is so, so, so valuable. So <clears throat> as I've mentioned, the current rapid decline in biodiversity that we're currently experiencing is, was originally called the biodiversity crisis, um, but it's actually just now just simply called the sixth great mass extinction event, as I've already alluded to. So now the reality is you might, and, and a lot of people will argue extinction is natural, and that is absolutely correct. Extinction is natural. It is. It just, it's just part of nature. Um, but the reality is when we actually look at how fast extinction is occurring during the Anthropocene, it's 100 or up to a thousand times higher than those prior to the Anthropocene and pre-industrial times. So is extinction natural? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. But the rate at which extinction is happening can only be explained by one thing, and that is us and what we are doing to the planet. So let's talk about how did we get into this mess? How are we in the middle of a mass extinction event? And unsurprisingly, it's just sort of things we do. And so um, I'm gonna give you a, a quote from, uh, from E.O. Wilson. So he's the guy we talked about in the very first class, really famous biologist. Uh, and E.O. Wilson said, the decline of Earth's biodiversity is an unintended consequence of multiple factors that have been enhanced by human activity. They could be summarized by the acronym HIPPO with the order of the letters corresponding to their rank in destructiveness. So we have H is habitat loss, I in invasive species, P for pollution, P for population, and O for overharvesting and overuse. So we're going to talk about these two today. Uh, we've, we're going to talk about pollution. Uh, we've talked a little bit about pollution thus far, but we're going to talk more about pollution later in the semester. Uh, and we're going to talk, we've already talked about population and overharvesting and tragedy of the commons. So we've already talked about P and O here. We've already talked about PO. And we're going to talk about HI today and P later in a later class. But you can really sort of see um, this um, in one of the, the poorer regions of the Western Hemisphere. And that's the, the sort of the dichotomy between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. You guys probably know they all, they're both on the same island in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, both of which these countries are um, are very, very poor, unfortunately, uh, with Haiti being the poorest country in the entire Western Hemisphere. Um, and it's been that way for, for quite a bit of time, unfortunately. Um, but you can see Haiti and the Dominican Republic, you can see the, the line, you can see the border between the two countries. And you see one country that has pretty dang good environmental policies and one country that has very, very poor environmental policies. And you can see Hippo working its magic here in Haiti. Um, and and uh, let's, so let's, let's, talk about the, let's talk about some Hippo things. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is actually habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. Um, now humans, um, 
we fragment habitats. And now you might ask yourself, what does a, a fragmentation look like? Well, it looks like one of three things. So we can look at a forest example here where we've logged to this forest, leading to small patches of forest here, here, and here, creating a fragmented habitat. We can also fragment habitats by putting roads. So you can see this road going through this nice uh, forest cuts this forest in half, cuts this ecosystem in half, fragmenting it. And then we can see an example here where we have a seagrass bed. Uh, a boat went through here with its propeller multiple times, chopped up the seagrass bed, made a bare spot here, thus fragmenting this seagrass bed. So it happens both on the land and in the ocean, as well as in lakes and stuff like that. So humans are great at breaking habitats into small patches. And you might think to yourself, why is this a big deal? Well, I'm going to give you a story um, because I think stories from 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 sort of common experiences that we probably all have experienced are a good way to illustrate how these things work. So as I mentioned earlier in the semester, I, I moved my sister from um, Rochester, New York, all the way down here to Massachusetts. So I had to drive uh, a moving truck six hours from Rochester down here. It's really, really boring um, because it's all just highway. It's the mass, it's uh, I-90 all the way. It's, it's really boring. However, when I was driving this, um, uh, truck through these forested areas, I have this fragmented habitat situation. Now, as I was driving, um, I saw a car like swerve. And I was like, what is, what, is, what is going on with this person? And I couldn't see anything on the road. And then I got closer and closer and closer. And I had a, frankly, a oh shit moment, because I had a swerve dramatically. And why did I swerve? Well, there was a monstrous about two foot wide snapping turtle trying to cross the road. So it was trying to cross the road like this. It was trying to go from one habitat to the next because that's what it that's what it needs to do. And so I almost killed this monster snapping turtle or potentially got into a bad accident because the habitat is fragmented by our roads. So again, this might not seem like a big deal, right? You could just walk across that, but this is a dangerous cross for multiple types of animals out there. Birds, turtles, other amphibians cats, dogs, it doesn't matter what it is, this is a dangerous crossing. And it's not just true here, it's true here as well. And it's true here as well, because while you might have not have to worry about cars here or here, you have to worry about predators here, right? And so ha habitat fragmentation is kind of a, a bad thing. But the other thing that happens with habitat fragmentation is simply habitats like this are simply too small to support life. I can't have predators in here. It's just not enough space. So fragmenting habitats is dangerous, but it's also just simply not large enough. Now, one of the cool things we're seeing now, we see these heavily in Japan. We're seeing these uh, in the Netherlands, and they're starting to pop up here in the United States, thankfully, is actually these cool wildlife bridges to span highways. So you can see we have this fragmented habitat by this highway in the Netherlands, and they built this bridge. They put grass, they put trees on it, so organisms can cross from one side to the other safely um, as best they can. Obviously it's, obviously, it's not perfect, right? Because an organism just could go whoop like that and get killed by a car, but it does a pretty good job of trying to solve that issue. So, potential possible solution, but again, not a perfect solution because I mean, what are we what are we going to do, right? Get rid of our roads? Right? We can't we can't do that. So, now let's look at a, another case of what this means. And so, I'm going to actually show you some cool. Uh, well, I don't know. I think it's a pretty cool thing uh, from this paper published in 2010. Now, this is um um. Oh, shoot. Oh, my goodness. I forgot where this is. This is somewhere <laughs> that I can't remember where it is. Uh, but you'll notice that this place is actually pretty fragmented. And so you'll see that there's this little pipe here, but it was actually fragmented. So you had this basically this dam built right here that created a pond here and a pond here. So we had a, a habitat that was previously connected and now it was fragmented because, again, this little dam that was built. So what these people did is they got an excavator in here, they dug it out and they put a pipe in here. And then they filled all the rest of the sand, you know, and dirt and stuff like that to recreate the bridge and the dam that they needed. But it allowed connectivity between the habitats very much like this wildlife bridge would do. And so you can sort of see the before and after pictures here, right? Creating a new habitat, allowing for connectivity. So what did this do? And actually it's pretty cool. We can look at um, two metrics, so species uh, richness or total number of species. And you can see pre-restoration, there was about eight species. In post-restoration, there was close to 16 species. So we had about a doubling of species um, or biodiversity in this area just by getting rid of the patchiness of the habitat, right? Improving connectivity between habitats, getting rid of that fragmentation. And then we can see the harvest, right? Uh, the, the, 
the grams of fish per uh, meter squared per year, so how much harvest they were taking. Um, and so you would see that prior to restoration, there was about 40-ish grams per meter squared per year. After that, we had about five times that at about 200 grams per meter squared per year. So pretty dramatic, right? Just by building a little pipe, taking one day, maybe a few thousand dollars, restoring connectivity between this ecosystem, fixing a fragmented ecosystem, fixing it restored richness and production, right? So we got both biodiversity and ecosystem services just by putting one $100 pipe between two habitats. Pretty cool. <clears throat> so the other part uh, about habitat change is what we call LUC or land use change. Now land use change is pretty straightforward. It's changing a natural habitat into something anthropogenic. Um, you might ask what that might be. It's building a city, building a town, growing food, or simply cutting a tree down to harvest it for timber. That's what land use change refers to. Um, and it's not just forests, right? It's, it's everything. It's grasslands, it's savannas, it's shrubs, it's everything. Um, people like to live in biodiversity hotspots, right? And so we changed the land to biodiversity hotspots quite a bit. And so um, just to sort of show you um, what that looks like, we can look at metric tons of hardwood, beef, and deforestation. So hardwood in yellow, beef in um, blue, and uh, deforestation rates in um, green here. It's on its own little axis. axis. But you can see uh, deforestation has just gone up and up and up and up. Um, in the Amazon, of course, I should I should um, preface that by saying this is the Amazon. Um, and then you see hardwood uh, harvesting has gone up and up and up, and it's starting to come down, or at least you know in the early 2000s. And then you can see beef production is just going up and up and up and up. And so what's going on? We're cutting down forests, uh, potentially burnt, just burning them. Um, that's the sort of the easy way to cut down a forest. And then taking that burnt forest or that cut down forest and raising livestock growing soybeans, something like that. And you could really see that actually um, in, uh, in, the Amazon, in the Amazon basin. It's really dramatic uh, where you can see red dots here are active um, fire identified by satellites. And you can basically see the entire sort of middle section here is basically on fire, <laughs> um, uh, which is pretty, pretty, pretty um, dramatic um, for 2019. So lots and lots of land use change going on here. Why is there land use change going on? Um, uh, for this. Now, it's a good question, Megan, why, is, why would they burn it? Well, the question is, what's more valuable, the timber or the beef? And the other question you can ask is, do you have the infrastructure or the resources as a businessman, if you're trying to grow cattle, to sell that wood or to even cut down that wood and, 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 and move it in a meaningful way. And so the reality is if you're just trying to go beef, which is a really, really successful business, it's just easier just to burn it and not have to worry about it. Now, in a perfect world, we wouldn't burn it. We would cut it down. We would use the timber for all different things, paper and, and so on and so forth, uh, and then grow the cattle. But again, if you're just a farmer in the Amazon basin trying to get some cows to sell, to make some cash, you know, support your family or whatever. It's just easier to set a fire, walk away, come back a few days later and have your cows graze on the forest that's starting to recover. So great question, Megan. But again, um, it's profits, right? It's easier to simply just not have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> it really is. So that's, uh, uh, that's really what's the reality of a lot of things. Um, you know, if businesses can take the, the, the cheap way out, right? We all, we all know they will, right? If I can avoid fixing a, the a construction issue, I will, right? Because it saves me money, and that's the sort of thing that's going on here. So, uh, and again, we can see all this land use change here in the Amazon. But land use change is actually something something that we're seeing globally. Um, and you can imagine, if I go from a nice, happy forest to this, I lose biodiversity along with it. And so, land use change does again bring with it the loss of biodiversity. So we could look at changes in land use in the um, the global on the global stage here, where we have forests in green and deforestation fronts, uh, both ongoing and projected by 20 in the 2010s to the 2030s. Um, and you can see basically all of our great forests, whether it's the Congo Basin, the Amazon Basin, the beautiful forests across the, the eastern islands of um, I'm sorry, the um, South Asian islands here, uh, all undergoing or protected to undergo massive amounts of land use change. So now to put this in perspective, uh, the, the Wild, World Wildlife Foundation estimates about 7.5 uh, 
million acres of forest are lost um, per year. Um, and um, people have actually sort of described this um, rapid change um, as what we would call death by a thousand cuts, because as we change the land, we actually degrade the land. Um, so cutting down a forest not only gets rid of the forest, but also makes the land less valuable, less able to essentially support biodiversity going forward as well. And so by cutting down forests, we get all this stuff from it. We hurt the forest in the short term. We also hurt the forest in the long term. And so people have described this idea as death by a thousand cuts because we're cutting down the forest, we're degrading the land, we're getting rid of the land. And again, we're just slowly, slowly eroding our forests. And um, yeah, so that's our land use change. Um, not so fun. Um, so let's talk about the I in hippo, um, which is exotic species. Now this is, or introduced species. Um, and so this is actually a, a, a topic I've worked on quite a bit. So I love this topic. This is my favorite part of hippo. And I've actually worked on it um, in the lens of this organism over here. You guys have definitely seen this if you've been in the Boston area. I and mean, you guys all go to Bentley, so you've been in the Boston area. But this is actually an invasive reed called Phragmites australis. Uh, it's called the common reed. It's one of the most invasive plants on the planet. Um, and so what does it mean to be invasive? Well, when something is invasive, it simply has moved from its, its previous range and it's moved into a brand new range. So in the case of Phragmites australis here, it used to be only found in Europe and it, and it got brought over here by colonists. So, you know, you know the Mayflower and all the, all the boats that followed. And it settled here in the United States as well, essentially spreading out throughout the entire United States. So that's what an invasive species, uh, it's also called an exotic species as well. Now you might ask yourself, why does the introduction of a new species bad? Why is, why is it bad? Uh, we're bringing new biodiversity. Shouldn't that be good? Well, the reality is these species actually exhibit some pretty stark characteristics. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example, not of Phragmites, because uh, plants are really hard to sort of tease out what bad things they do. Um, we're actually going to talk about this in the, in the context of actually a pretty cool fish. Um, and you guys have probably seen this fish before. It's the lionfish, uh, Terrace uh, volatans and Terrace miles. Um, two species of lionfish, really, really cool looking fish. You can buy them from aquariums. They're, they're, they're awesome. Now, the lionfish um, has a native range throughout the uh, Indo-Pacific Islands, as well as all the way down the coast of Africa, as well as the Red Sea. And, and, and um, um, I forget what that place is called. I don't know, whatever that part's called. Like, I can't remember. I can't remember all the names. So pretty big range of um, this fish. Um, but it's an, I'm talking about this in the context of an invasive species. So clearly the species has to invade somewhere. And this fish actually invaded the Caribbean. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about how it got to the, from this place to the Caribbean. Well, the reality is it actually was just brought here via the commercial pet trade. They're awesome looking fish. They look cool. They'd be great to have in a saltwater aquarium. So people brought them um, over here to sell them so people could have them in aquariums. But clearly they did not stay in people's aquariums. They got out. Uh, so when they got into aquariums, they got out in a number of mechanisms, including uh, via hurricanes, in particular Hurricane Andrew, massive, massive hurricane in the 90s, uh, category five, huge amounts of damage. Lots of these fish escaped during Hurricane Andrew. Uh, and subsequent hurricanes as well, I should say. Uh, we also know that uh, many resorts were actually just releasing them. Uh, they would bring them, they would bring them over um, and release them into their water so people could see the fish because they're so cool. And we also see them getting out via ballast water, uh, so like escaping, um, like during a uh, during like wastewater of ships and and stuff like that. So they were directly being uh, introduced by humans. And yeah, this is sorry this. I don't know. I can never get this stupid thing to work. Anyways, I had a cool video, but again, it never, it just never seems to work. So uh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll post the link to Blackboard so you can, you can see it. But for some reason, I just can never get this stupid thing to work in a slideshow. It's going to show you how it expanded out, but it's not really that big a deal. So what made the line fish so successful? Why is it? Why, why, why do we care? Why do we care if a species is brought from A to B? Well, the reality is, things that are invasive or have the capacity to become invasive have some pretty common uh, characteristics about them. So lionfish, um, as with all invasive species, need numerous introductions. You can't just release five individuals in Florida and then they become invasive. They need multiple points of entry um, <clears throat> um, just to simply 
establish. They need enough population to, for them to establish. They typically, as an invasive species, reproduce very quickly. So these would be what we would consider typically our adapted, our adapted species, right? Things like mice. Um, they produce large numbers of eggs or large numbers of offspring. Again, a characteristic of our adapted species. And if you were to ask me, are all invasive species are adapted species, I would say, yeah, pretty much. Most invasive species are our adapted species. Uh, they have, in the case of the, of the lionfish, they have very lar long pelagic larval life cycles, as you can um, um, sort of get at. They, um, they live very deep down for a very long time, um, or not for a very long time, but they live deep down. So it's kind of hard to get rid of their larva um, once they get there. They are habitat and diet generalists. They'll basically eat anything. And so you can see this lionfish here that was captured. You can see it's got all these different species of fish here, and it's got a little uh, little crawfish here or shrimp or whatever you want to call it. So they eat a lot, and they will basically live anywhere, which is kind of a kind of a cool thing. Uh, they have no native predators um, or prey. They don't. They don't. They're not like bears where they eat uh, salmon, or they're not like um, mice where they get worried about eaten by like hawks and crows and, and all these things. They had, nothing was really designed to to eat them. Um, that they just they they at least in Florida, of course, in the Florida region. Um, because they're not in their native range, they had no native diseases or no known parasites. Once they got out of their larval phase, they grew really, really rapidly. So they would go from basically a larva to an adult in basically a three to four month period. Very, very rapid growth. Um, they also were venomous. Now, this one doesn't have any spines on it. But as I showed you in the first picture of them, they have spines on them. And those spines are venomous um, on both uh, their, their dorsal side. So again, they would be here. Their anal fins are also, uh, and their pelvic fins also have spines on them. So um, they are venomous. They also do some cool stuff. Um, if you if you guys uh, are interested in this, I recommend Googling um, uh, lionfish and how they hunt because lionfish actually to capture prey will oftentimes blow jets of water to disorient their prey and then gobble their prey up. <laughs> so it's actually kind of a Kind of a cool thing they do. Uh, and they also have some pretty wild physiological adaptations that are simply not found in the fish in the Florida region. Uh, and they basically can live um, in saltwater or freshwater. It doesn't really matter. They can live in either. So lots of crazy characteristics of this fish. But again, most of these things are pretty characteristic of most invasive species. Most are adapted species. So the question we can ask is, why do we care about the lionfish? Well, they do, they do a couple things that we know of, but lots of things they do, we actually don't quite fully understand yet. So we do know the lionfish, um, and it's been documented pretty heavenly that they will actually directly consume juvenile fish, and they've been implicated with the decline of numerous fish species in the Caribbean because they just, they're eating the fish. Um, they also have been implicated um, to compete with other spe species of fish for prey items. So in inducing um, some level of population control on other species of fish. They're also poisonous. So they, you know, if you get stung by one, you could potentially die if you suffer from some severe allergies. Um, but again, they're sort of disrupting these ecosystems. And that's clearly not a good thing. But the, the extent of why they're bad, we still don't fully grasp. Um, but we do know they come in, they disrupt biodiversity, and that is bad. So uh, we covered H and I, we talked about over exploitation already, but I'll just refresh your memory of what over exploitation is. Uh, it includes awful pictures like this of hunt, hunting um, African endangered African wildlife like rhinos and, and things like that. Um, so just just being a jackass for lack of a better way to call it. <laughs> um, or over harvesting resources such as this um, this vessel here that has thousands of shark fins. They catch the sharks, they cut the fins off, throw the sharks back in the water because people believe shark fins have medicinal properties. Um, it's not really accurate, but that's what people believe. And so it leads to an over-exploitation of sharks as a resource. And so this again is directly tragedy of the commons, right? Over-exploiting a resource for short-term gain at the expense of the long-term health. And the rhinos are a good example of this. We exploited the crap out of them for their horns and hunting and stuff like that. And now every species of rhino is about on the brink of extinction. Again, an over-exploited resource. Now, uh, gl climate change is also another way. Now, we'll talk a lot more about this in the climate change lecture, but I want to foreshadow it here. Uh, climate change as a process is expected to threaten uh, between a quarter 
or uh, uh, sorry, at least a quarter of all species on the planet by the year 2050. So climate change is projected to dramatically harm biodiversity worldwide. Um, but again, we'll talk about this in a few classes. We're going to spend we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about climate change because, as we'll discuss, it is the defining issue of of not only this class but also of just our generation. So, or generations, I should say. So, we'll come back to climate change in a few um, in a few classes. So, that's hippo. Um, what can we do to reduce biodiversity loss? Well, the reality is. Restoration, as we talked about in the case of the Florida Everglades, it's good, but it's reactionary, right? I destroyed the Florida Everglades, so I'm, but I'm trying to bring it back. And restoration is great, but again, it's reactionary. If Sometimes if you destroy an ecosystem, you simply just can't bring it back to life. Now, that's, that's conservation. So that's um, restoration. But what we really should be doing is conservation, protecting what we already have, because you know, the Florida Everglades is a great example, valuable, it's being restored, but that Florida Everglades is never going to be the same as it was before humans moved in. So how do we conserve things? Well, it's the reality is just protecting large pieces of land, protecting our biodiversity hotspots, um, preventing people from uh, overexploiting resources, right? That those sorts of things are how we conserve biodiversity. Um, and it, we better enforcing laws, on the books, that's another big one. And not weakening our laws on the books, but only strengthening them and strengthening the penalties. Um, because the reality is most penalties for like a lot of destruction of wildlife is, are fines. And the people that are destroying wildlife, they don't care about a million dollar fine. Um, that's just the cost of doing business. So uh, uh, most people argue that um, jail time is the better way to go for biodiversity um, destruction and, 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 and stuff like that. Just, just, to, just to put that out there. Um, now, other issues, uh, other ways we could potentially do it is by having more zoos and aquariums. Now, there's also all, uh, some pretty severe ethical issues about keeping animals in captivity. But the reality is if you see a polar bear, you're more likely to protect that polar bear. And so by exposing people to animals, you're more likely to um, protect them. And I can tell you that that's 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 100 percent true um, for most people, because my deep love of nature stems from zoos and aquariums as a kid, watching documentaries on TV as a kid. That's where my deep love of these things stems from. So knowing that they exist, knowing why they're important can convince people to protect them. Um, now, provided we can't conserve things and just be good humans to nature, uh, actually doing things such as um, seed banks so it's, and gene banks, as well as pollen banks. So storing species before they go extinct, their genetic material, their pollen, their seeds. So if they do go extinct, we can bring them back um, with their seeds, with their DNA or with their pollen. Um, and there's also some people, and we discussed this a tiny bit, but potentially bringing species back from the dead. And we discussed this in the context of the passenger pigeon, using our cool genetic engineering tools to bring back species that have gone extinct. Um, you know, if rhinos go extinct within the next five years, using cool genetic en engineering to bring them back. But ex that's expensive. That's a, that's a hard thing to do. Now, we can actually um, sort of conceptualize what biodiversity conservation would need to look like. And we can actually um, do this with our friend E.O. Wilson, and he has a fantastic quote. Uh, E.O. Wilson says, to save biodiversity, we need to set aside about half the Earth's surface as a natural reserve. I'm not suggesting we have one hemisphere for all humans and the other half for the rest of life. I'm talking about allocating up to one half of the surface of the land and the sea as a preserve for the remaining flora and fauna. And how can we do this? Well, the reality is it's just protecting some pretty key areas, right? The Amazon Basin, the Congo Basin, New Guinea, our islands, right? These biodiversity hotspots, creating habitats in, in, in crab, habitat uh, corridors in industrialized parts of the world to prevent you know, habitat fragmentation from being such a huge issue um, and potentially doing things like protecting large parts of the ocean, putting moratoriums on fishing um, in fishing industries that are destructive, such as shark fisheries. So there's lots of ways to protect biodiversity, but, but clearly there's a lot, um, a lot that needs to be done. And, and I hope I've convinced you that biodiversity is not only important for just the planet, but it's also important for sort of your average everyday life. So let's talk about some, 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 some numbers, some hot off the press research. So this is um, all taken from this paper here, a really big paper that came out last year. Um, and in this paper, they documented that about 58.4% of all land is actually under moderate to severe human pressure. Um, 
And what does that mean? It just simply means that humans are encroaching on it. Land use change is occurring at, a, at an increased rate. So 58.4% of land, that is a massive amount of our planet. And between 20, 2000 and 2013, about 1.9 million kilometers was actually heavily modified or just simply lost. Um, and that's a massive amount of land. Um, you're talking about, you know, country size amounts of land. And we can see it's actually not, um, not uniform. Not every habitat on the planet is experiencing the same human induced impacts. So we can see this human footprint here in red is highly modified. Green is intact and dark greens are like just pure wilderness. And you can see there are some pure wilderness, right? The, 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 um, the Arctic here, um, large parts of Australia, the Sahara Desert, and a decent chunk of our, our um, Amazon basin and some parts of the Congo basement, a decent amount of the Asian islands, and a pretty hefty chunk here in Central Asia as well, as well as here in Saudi Arabia and, and those, um, uh, those on the, the peninsula here. And so there is some intact wild, some intact areas, but lots of our planet, including tropic, the tropics is heavily, heavily damaged. You can see India is basically on fire, right? This area of China, basically on fire, right? Europe on fire, Eastern part of the United States basically on fire. So clearly we're changing the planet, but it's not a uniform change. And that's, that's a pretty common theme we see. You change on the planet is not typically uniform. Certain places are hit much, much harder. Now, um, we sort of mentioned um, uh, the United Nations um, <clears throat> um, in this lecture, and we mentioned that the United Nations has did set some goals for, maybe, I, I don't know if I, I mentioned or not, if I've, I think I did, but I, I could have missed it. The United States, the United Nations did set some goals for 2020 to try to preserve biodiversity, and we actually completely missed out on all project trajectories of, of conservation. Um, and it wasn't even close. Um, so all the stuff we said that we were gonna do in the early 2000s by 2020, we didn't even try to do basically. And so I like this quote um, and it says, global wildlife populations are in free fall, plunging by two thirds because of human overconsumption, population growth and intensive agriculture. And in total about two thirds of the world's wildlife was wiped out in the past 50 years. Uh, if you wanna read a little bit more about that, Take a peek at these two articles from The Guardian as well as Smithsonian, really talking about that of all these trajectory, trajectories we tried to hit, we simply failed. Now, the reality is, how could we potentially fix this? Now, there's this really great article that was published in Nature. Um, I, you know, if, if uh, any of this interests you, definitely read it. It's a really, really, really big article, really, really chock full of great information about this topic. But how can we fix our biodiversity problem? The reality is, we could do some pretty easy. You know, I mean, they would be difficult to implement because people are stubborn, but relatively few number of things. So the big one is just actually food, sustainable agriculture. Don't do, we'll, we'll talk about what agriculture looks like later in the semester, but don't farm and grow food the way we do now um, and reduce the intensity of agriculture, allow places to recover, plant cover crops, things like that. That's sort of the big one, changing the way we grow food because the way we grow food is really destructive. The other one uh, is reducing food waste. Now we'll talk about this a lot with climate change because it's a big part of climate change, but just throwing away less food, which means you're consuming less. Um, switching to less beef consumption. And it, that might be beef consumption in the sense of, I mean, like what, like, you know, I'm growing cows or growing pork, you know, those sorts of things, uh, or potentially switching to like, um, you know, like those lab grown meats that are starting to be piloted. That might be a potential good way of, of, of helping with this biodiversity crisis. Um, but the reality is um, all those things work, but as does protection and restoration, trying to bring nature back from the precipice that it sort of sits in right now. So, <clears throat> Um, let's go back to the question we started with, and this is the last slide. Why protect a polar bear? Why should we protect a single species? Well, there's a lot of answers to this question. There's a lot of answers to this question. Um, and I want you guys to think a little bit about it. Think about if you were in an argument with someone and someone said, why do I care about one species? What would you say to that person? Now, what I would like you to take away for why to protect a species is that losing one species, it's not, as, it's not a huge deal, right? It's one species, there's millions of species, but the reality is the loss of one species in a species that is, is sort of prominent in its ecosystem as a polar bear is really a symptom of the larger decline in biodiversity. So the loss of one species, I would argue, 
and most people argue, is not a huge deal. But again, it is a symptom of a larger problem. If you lose a species as important as the polar bear, you're inviting the loss of other species. And then as we lose species, we lose our ecosystem and we lose all the services that it provides. So why protect a polar bear? That's my thoughts on it. But I want you guys to think a little bit about it. Um, I hope, I sort of hope this, um, I sort of hope you sort of understand the, the sort of state things are in. I don't try to do these things to like scare you. You know, you might, you might get that. I don't know. Sometimes people get that idea of like, I'm trying to scare them or I'm just trying to give you the facts. Like I'm just trying to show you where we're at and what sort of dire crisis we're in. What you do with that information, how you feel about that information is really up to you. Um, uh, but again, I'd like you to sort of reflect and think a little bit about that. And one way to really reflect and think about this is to actually, if you if you want to, this is a completely op optional discussion board. You don't have to do it. Um, but if you want to do it to get you thinking a little bit about more about this question of why to protect a polar bear, hop on over to the IUCN site. Um, select uh, a plant and animal species. Select something that you think is interesting, right? potentially something that's endangered or threatened, or maybe something that's not threatened. And based on the information and do a little bit of research online, if you lost that species, so say you like tigers, what would happen if we lost tigers? What would that mean to the forest of Asia? What if we lost lions? What would that mean to the savannas of Africa? And that really helped get, sort of puts this idea of why protect a polar bear into perspective. So I will create a discussion board on Blackboard for you guys. If you want to do this, um, it's, it's completely optional. It's not graded um, great. Um, if you don't want to do it, I understand. But again, I wanted to just sort of get you guys thinking about that question. And the best way to get you to think about that question is think about what happens if you lose your favorite species, right? If I lost, um, I don't know, for instance, I really like, uh, I really like red-winged blackbirds. What would happen here in Massachusetts if we lost those red-winged blackbirds that I really like? Um, anyways, so that's part one of today's class. Um, um, no, you don't need to reply to anyone's post. I just want to see what you guys are thinking. Um, this again, this is not a graded discussion board. It's completely optional. If you don't do it, I won't think any. I won't think any um, anything poorly of you or anything like that. So don't worry if you don't have time to do it. But again, it's a great exercise to get you thinking about how one species matters to its ecosystem. So whew. it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. So um, that's the first part of class. Now, um, do you guys? Would you guys like a break? Um, to sort of chill out for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Um, generally speaking, um, the exam reviews only takes about like 20 minutes or so uh, to maybe 30 minutes. Um, but you guys would, you guys like a break? You just want to keep pushing through. Um, well, I got three people and uh, that's uh, about one seventh of the class. So I'm going to say that's reflective of everyone. All right. So, oops, I did not mean to do that. So if you if you perused over to Blackboard, you would see there's a study guide for you. This study guide is just a Word document. It's got topics in it. Um, that's there for you. Um, and then you'll see there's review slides. That's what we're going to go through right now. So these review slides are basically the slides from our lectures thus far that I've pulled um, that I've pulled out that uh, I, I are you're basically going to be tested on. Now you might ask yourself what lectures do I need to sort of think about? Um, just to sort of go back to our um, our syllabus, we're going to basically cover most of the lectures. The one lecture we're not going to cover at all, I'm going to save for the second half of the course, for the second exam, is actually the water and air lecture. Um, so the water and air lecture, don't need to worry about it at all. Um, we're just going to be covering intro to environmental science, welcome to the Anthropocene, ecosystem services, and a little bit of ethics and economics, populations, urbanization, as well as today's class of biodiversity. So no need to worry about water and air. Again, we'll come back to water and air for the second exam because it fits much better in the second half of the course. But I don't know, I divide the course into like basic science and then like applied science and learning about water and air is more of a basic science sort of thing. So that's why we cover it here. So but again, those things are there for you. Now, uh, next Wednesday, right? Next Wednesday, right? When your exam is, what you'll do is you'll log on to Blackboard. You don't need to do anything special. You just come over here. You click this exams and quizzes folder. The exam will be hanging out right here for you. You click on it. It'll tell you about the exam. Like you have this much time, blah, 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 all this, all this stuff. Um, it'll give you like some basic instructions. But let's talk about what, what to expect. 
um, what should we expect? Now, if you have any questions along the way, um, let me know. But I, but as I, I think I sort of mentioned in the first class, um, I will only test you on things that um, that I've covered in lecture um, and, and things that I, and, and very little on the things that I've assigned. So what we're going to go through today, we've covered in depth at some point during the semester. So you don't need to worry about finding extra knowledge. If you have your slide deck open, um, that'll have all the knowledge you need to answer the questions. Uh, so let's talk about this exam. Um, so the exam is timed. Now, um, you might ask yourself, you might ask me, why, why are you timing us? The reality is if I don't time you, it makes the exam significantly easier. Um, and it really does. So generally speaking, I give students about 2.5 hours or two and a half hours. Um, so two hours and 30 minutes to do this exam. Now, if you look at sort of the slide here, we have 20 multiple choice questions, seven short answer questions, and two essay questions, giving you 30, uh, giving you a grand total of 100 points or 25% of your grade. Um, so it is worth a bit of your grade, but it is fully open notes, fully open, technically open book, but you, you don't really have a book, fully open internet. So you have all the resources at your hand to use. Now, this exam will go live on the day of the exam. So next Wednesday, it'll go live at 12.01 a.m. And it will disappear from Blackboard at 12 p.m. that night. So there's a 24-hour period for you guys to do the exam. And I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys, I'll remind you guys of this information before I post the exam to Blackboard. Don't worry. Um, but there is 24 hours for you to do it. So you can start it at 12, you know, 12.01 a.m. or you can start it at 10 p.m. that night. It doesn't really matter. As long as you start it within that 24 hour period, you'll get the full two and a half hours to do it. So I, I do that just to make things easier because sometimes people like, you know, they have a uh, they need to go to the store or something and it's not convenient or whatever. Um, in terms of that time period, if if you have any special accommodations, um, I think there's at least one person, uh, please let me know so I can set that up on Blackboard for you so you get all the extra time that you need. Um, that being said, if you're working on your exam and you're just having a tough time and you feel like you're running out of time and you're like, I could really use another 10 minutes on this, um, or I didn't get to upload my essay um, because the exam finished on me, just send me an email. Um, like for instance, if you're working on your essay <laughs> and you know you, you didn't get to submit or something, or you didn't get to finish typing a few sentences, just send it to me. Um, I've been more than happy to just count it. Um, I don't want you, I, I put the time limit because again, if I don't put a time limit, it's way too easy, but I don't want to put the time limit as being it too hard, but two and a half hours seems to be about the sweet, the sweet spot. So, um, but again, 20 multiple choice, seven short answer, two essay questions. I will give you the essay questions beforehand. So just to let you know, you'll have the essay questions before the exam even starts. So that's a pretty cool thing. Now, what you do with those questions is up to you. So I know some people, <clears throat> I know some people will write the essay beforehand and you can do that. I will never know the difference. Or you can write notes that you wanna take for the essay and then type the essay out during the time. Or you can just say, screw it. And I'm just not gonna look at the essay question that the professor sent me. You can do whatever you want with that information. Whatever you want, you do with it. But you'll get the questions. Um, I'm gonna send them, I'll send them later today for you guys. So you'll have the essay questions. Now, the other question people ask me really, really commonly is, how much do I need to write? And the reality is, I want you to write as little as possible. <laughs> and, and I say that for two reasons. The first is, I don't want to read a 10-page paper. And you don't want to write a 10-page paper. That, that much I know. Um, I, I know no one in their right mind ever wants to write a 10-page paper. And, and I certainly don't want to read 20 four 10 page papers. That's awful. Uh, second, I want you to just to write enough to answer the question. So if you can take do one of my short answer questions and it takes you two sentences and you answer the question, great. If it takes you 10 sentences, okay. If it takes you a paragraph, two paragraphs, a page, okay. But just write what you need to answer the questions. I'm never going to take points off if you write too much. I'm never going to take points if you write too little. Um, simply just answer the question. As long as the question is, the answer to the question is there, you'll be fine. That's what I look for. I don't, I don't look for like, I, I know you guys probably have professors like, oh, a minimum of five pages. I think that's dumb. I, I, th I really think it's dumb. Um, I just, as long as you answer the question, that's all I really care. Now, the essay questions, they should be longer than the short answer questions because they require a little bit more thought to answer. So just as an FYI, you know, 
the essay questions are going to require a little bit more girth in terms of length to, to, to really get a good grade on them. Um, just to let you know. But again, I have people that answer short answer questions in one sentence and get full credit. So just as an FYI, don't like, don't be like, don't be like, oh, I only wrote two sentences for this. I don't know. As long as you provided the information for the question, you'll be okay. Now, the final thing I'll say about sort of a um, um, logistical thing, I will be available the whole day. So if you have any questions, just answer me. I'll try to answer back as fast as I can. Um, <clears throat> I'll be slower to answer if it's at 10 o'clock at night of that day, but I'll try to answer as best as I can for you guys. Um, and if you need like a, a Zoom call, because I can't explain something over email, just let me know. I'm here for you to help you guys. Um, try to make this as stress-free as possible, but I know that that's never a thing with exams because exams are inherently stressful. Um, and the final thing I'll say is um, when you are writing, I do not want to see a single quote in your answer. This is, is an exam. This should be in your own words. So if I tell you that uh, biodiverse, we're in the, currently in the middle of the sixth great mass extinction, you can't take my words in quotes and put them as your answer. You need to take that, the, what I said, put it in your own words, and then answer it. So just to let you know, if you put a quote in an answer, you'll just get a zero for that question. I, I won't even try like to read the answer and see if you got it right. I'm just going to give you zero. <laughs> just let you know. Uh, this is an exam. I need to see your thinking on the matter. I don't need to see what some guy on Wikipedia wrote or what some scientist wrote on his blog. I need to see what you have. So, all right. So does anybody have any um, questions about the sort of the logistics of the exam? Um, I think I, I think I hit all the main points. And I think I got most of the questions most people usually ask. Um, if you don't, if you don't think of a question now, and or you forget something, uh, let me know. I'll post like the stuff to Blackboard uh, the day before the exam, so you'll you'll have the information just in case you forget it. Or if you have any questions in the meantime, again, feel free to um, reach out. So, <clears throat> all right. So, what are the topics? So we got uh, twenty, uh, well, forty-one slides to go through. So let's um, let's go through them. Let's talk about some of the key points. Uh, and I brought these slides together for a very specific reason. When I wrote the questions, I pulled the information from these slides. So this is a pretty good study guide. I make good study guides because I hated, I hated it. I hated, I hated, I hated. I hated my teachers when I was in college. They made the worst study guides. They would say, oh, just study chapter five through 10 or study these concepts or anything like, like but it would be so broad. You would never know what to study. So you'd have to study chapters and chapters and chapters of stuff and then only a small proportion of the exam and I hated that I hated that so freaking much so my study guides not to pat myself on the back but they're the bee's knees of study guides so everything you need to know is in the study guide so don't fret um, I got you back so uh, the first thing we really discuss is the Anthropocene. Now, remember, the Anthropocene is the time by which humans are on this planet, right? The part where we started making a meaningful impact. You're welcome, Samantha. I, like I said, I, I, I'm not that much older than you guys, so I remember what college is like. So I remember being angry at my cell biology professor and my genetics professor for their crappy study guides. So plus you guys aren't scientists. So you guys, you know, you, you shouldn't have to worry about terrible science teachers. So anyways, so the Anthropocene, humans affecting the planet. Now, how do we affect the planet? Well, it's lots of ways, right? We alter the atmosphere, we alter the geology, the high, the water, the biosphere, and every other system you could think of, that's what the Anthropocene really gets at. And that sort of dictates the rise of humans, right? Now, it's not just like modern times where we're destroying the planet or altering the planet. It's basically since day one. And, and that's really a function of, of sort of us as a species. We're very, very intelligent. We use tools very, very well. But the Anthropocene is a pretty long time period. Now, um, we see sort of records of this throughout history. We see massive extinctions, events, um, including loss of 72% of all mammals on the continent of North America. And we saw this really come to, to fruition with the advent of two key industrial applications. The first is agriculture, and that was about 11,000 years ago or so. As we saw in today's class, land use change for agriculture is kind of a big deal. Um, that was the first one, right? Agriculture. Um, agricultural revolution way back in the day, um, that led to the domestication. Now domestication is, uh, I spent a bunch of time talking about this because I really like it. 
um, because I like lots of things that most people don't like. But domestication is really cool. Taking a wild plant, a wild animal, selecting for traits that make it better, more nutritious, easier to grow for humans, which leads to scenes like this, where we see massive yields of corn per acre. Now, remember wild, the wild relative of corn, this little uh, happy guy here called Teosinte, about five-ish bushels per acre. Domestication of corn led to essentially a four times increase or four plus in times increase to well over 20 bushels per acre. And then when we paired that with fertilizer, industrial fertilizer, it led to an explosion of corn yields over time. So domestication, super duper important. Without domestication of plants and animals, we simply could not sustain the massive population that we have right now. It's just impossible. You can't feed a population of 7.5 billion without this. There's just simply not enough arable land on the planet to grow 20 bushels per acre and then feed the entire planet. It's just, it's just simply not possible. Now, <clears throat> we discussed uh, the tragedy of the commons, uh, but we discussed three distinct ways to think about the planet. Now, we have the anthropocentric worldview, i.e. only human lives matter. The biocentric worldview, where every organism matters, and then the ecosystem worldview, where the entire connected system matters. I hope the ecocentric worldview was really sort of uh, tied in together nicely today with the biocentric worldview about how they are really interconnected and how they really sort of prop one another up. Um, I hope that was clear today um, about that sort of role that they are together. But those are the three worldviews. There's a question on that. Just let you know. Then we discuss the tragedy of the commons. Now, remember, the tragedy of the commons is exploiting a resource uh, in the short term at, a, at, its, at its expense in the long term. The passenger pigeons was our example here. We harvested the crap out of the passenger pigeons, right? I showed you that picture with the mountains of passenger pigeons that somebody killed. We overexploited that resource, and that led to an extinction event for our passenger pigeons. And so we, we tragedy of the commons, it's it's probably, I guess it's a verb now. Uh, um, the passenger pigeon, again, exploited it, overused it as a resource. And in terms of, of biology, that means going extinct. That's, that's what that ultimately means. Um, but we can also think about tragedy of the commons in the lens of, say, fossil fuels, right? We've used fossil fuels for well over 100 years now. There's going to come a point in time not too far from now, where things like oil and, and, and natural gas simply are not accessible in the way they are now. And so we can, tragedy of the commons doesn't just apply to uh, animals. It can also apply to natural resources such as fossil fuels. So those are the sort of the key things to remember about um, tragedy of the commons and, and the Anthropocene and the rise of humans. The next thing we sort of dove into was ecosystems. Now, what is an ecosystem? It's a, a sort of this dynamic system. Uh, that, that um, varies depending on where you are on the planet. Um, but it's an interplay between what's alive, i.e. the biotic components, and what's not living, the abiotic components. And they both influence one another. So if you have lots of sunlight, that influences all your plants, which are primary producers, which in turn influences all this stuff, which then in turn influences all this stuff. So everything in an ecosystem is connected. They change not only in different spaces. So Massachusetts has a different ecosystem than Australia does or Arizona or Florida, um, but they also change over time, right? Your backyard looks different today than it's going to look in December or February, right? So ecosystems change over time. But again, they are a connection between the two of them, uh, between the living and the non-living. And again, they both influence one another in both directions. Now, biodiversity, uh, as we discussed uh, today pretty heavily, they underpin the way ecosystem functions. So loss of biodiversity leads to a loss of, 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 of ecosystems, right? You lose biodiversity, you lose the health of ecosystems. And that's a really important thing to take away, not only from today's lecture, but also from sort of the example I gave you here, more biodiverse ecosystems simply function better. Now, we talked about this in the context of ecosystem services, right? Putting a dollar value on nature, it's hard, right? But it's doable. And so we can do it by assessing ecosystem services, which is just simply a term that describes what things nature provides for us. What things that have a tangible or sometimes intangible value to the human population. Um, so those are divided into four distinct categories. So let's talk about those. Uh, the first is our provisioning services, things we take. 
food, water, timber, plant fibers, natural gas and oil, things we can take and sell. Uh, medicine is also one of those things. So for those of you that have ever had a headache and you took aspirin or acetaminophen, Tylenol or ibuprofen, um, Advil, um, you took those medicines that were derived from nature. So kind of a, kind of a, a misunderstood aspect of a provisioning service. Um, we can derive things from nature and then move them into a lab to make them. And it's still considered a provisioning service. Um, now we have the regulating services, these um, that help maintain ecosystem integrity. Remember we defined ecosystem integrity as the, um, the overall health of an ecosystem. If there's high integrity, we have high ecosystem health, low integrity, low ecosystem health. And so we think about it in the context of today's class, low integrity means something that has the land use changes dramatically changed or degraded the ecosystem. We have very, very high integrity means we have a very pristine ecosystem with very little land use change. So making that connection because, you know, they're, they're connected. <laughs> um, these include some things that we don't really quite think about, but are very, very valuable. Remember, I told you pollination is worth billions of dollars every year to the global and the United States economy. Um, but lots of things, including protecting our coasts, uh, bringing, uh, protecting purifying water, purifying air. Uh, as we talked about, water and air purification are kind of a big deal, right? Um, we have lots of polluted waterways, lots of polluted airways. And so these ecosystem services, while we don't think about them, are very valuable. Then we have our cultural services, our direct connection with nature, art, music, recreation, spiritual sustenance, science education, um, all that good stuff that we can use nature for without taking anything from it. It's just appreciating nature for all the awesome things that nature actually does. Uh, and that's our cultural services. And then we have our final one where we have our supporting services. Um, these are just the underpinnings of the ecosystem, photosynthesis, cycling of nutrients, things like that. So pretty abstract one, um, but again, clearly a very important thing. Now, just to sort of connect this back to today's lecture, um, and sort of actually connecting it back to this slide as well. Um, um, ecosystems that are very biodiverse have a lot more photosynthesis process nutrients better, form more soil, cycle water better, and form more habitat. So again, biodiversity underpins not just this one, not just this one, not just this one, but also this one. So biodiversity is really the bee's knees. Now, there's a question, I'll just tell you this right now, there's a question, a short answer question about the Florida Everglades and about the slide, about the return on investment, why it's so valuable to the Florida Everglades. Why is, I'm sorry, why is the Florida Everglades so valuable and why is restoring it a good idea? So just to let you know, there is uh, a very valuable thing. Now, one thing I actually failed to mention, and that's actually in my notes here, uh, it, it was estimated to actually create about 442,000 jobs for both the state of Florida and the surrounding areas. So a really valuable you know, economic piece as well. Um, not just these things, but also like, hey, I have a job now. It's kind of always a, you know, always a good thing, especially that's like the focus of every presidential election is I'm going to create jobs, right? And clearly ecosystem restoration creates a sizable amount of jobs. But again, the Florida Everglades, um, really, really successful um, and really, really important restoration. But again, we restored ecosystem services, our provisioning, our regulating, um, as well as our cultural ones and our supporting services, bringing this ecosystem back from its tarnished state into a less tarnished state, giving us a, about a 4.04 return on investment. So again, every dollar you invest into the Everglades to restore the ecosystem, bringing back biodiversity, which in turn brings back these services, nets you a return of $4.04. Or for an $11 billion investment, you get back $46 billion. So not a bad chunk of change for the state of Florida and the surrounding region, as well as all the people who are employed to do this actual sort of thing. So the next sort of big thing we discuss was populations. Now we defined a population of a set of, in, of species living in the same area. I gave you a species as a group of individuals capable of breeding and producing viable offspring. That's what a population is, just to refresh your memory. And we can talk about how to structure a population and you guys did this to an extent in your in your in your lab uh, by sex, by age, or size. If you're talking about plants, but when we think about population structure, we're thinking about when organisms are going to die, how old do they make it to, um, and we can really think about this by 
by thinking about uh, how fast the population grows. And we did talk about two distinct types of growth, um, the J-curve, uh, which is our exponential growth. This is something that our, our selected species do, right? Our mice, mice are the characteristic our selected species. Then we did talk about the lionfish today. Uh, and the lionfish also follows the J-curve once it came here, just to, just to let you guys know that. But the J-curve, um, again, by our selected species, uh, really rapid rise, right? Exponential growth, really, 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 really rapid. Um, but exponential growth can't last forever, right? It's limited by resources, food, water, space, and an increase of density dependent factors that we'll talk about in just a moment. But typically speaking, um, we uh, have more what we call logistic growth or an S curve where population grows decently fast, um, but eventually hits a, a, a ill-defined K or carrying capacity. It's hard to determine what K is, just, just as a note, that's why, it's, that's why I call it ill-defined. Um, but remember, K really does stand for the maximum amount of individuals that a place can sustainably keep indefinitely. So if, if, if that number is 500 elephants, carrying capacity of elephants would be 500, right? So it's kind of hard to determine but there is an upper limit on how many individuals you can have in a set area. Again, it's all based upon resources, right? If there's a lot of resources, you can have more individuals. If there's few resources, you can have less individuals, right? So it's like, think about if like you have a pizza party, right? <laughs> if, I have a, if I have one pizza, I can only have say two friends over. But if I have 10 pizzas, I can probably have 10 friends over because uh, most of my friends like to eat pizza a lot. So, but you get the idea, little bit of pizza, small population, a lot of pizza, a lot more people. And that's what we're seeing with carrying capacity. Um, and it does vary between organisms. Um, and, uh, and just as a reminder, the S curve is very, very much what we see for, um, oh my goodness, uh, K adapted species or K selected species such as humans, as well as elephants. Now we talked um, a little bit about um, two factors that limit population growth. Now, the first one we talked about was density dependent factors, which is um, reflective of how dense your population is. The more dense your population gets, the more likely these are to help limit your population's growth. And as your population gets more and more abundant, more and more dense, you get more predation, you get more disease, and you get more competition for resources, competition for food, competition for water, competition for space, and competition for breeding partners all increase as your population simply get larger. Now we have our density independent factors, which don't really give a crap how big your population are. If you get hit by a flood, they're gonna knock your population down. <laughs> That's simply what they are. So it doesn't matter how dense you are, floods, storms, avalanches, natural disasters act as a way to limit population growth, population size. And so I've sort of defined these already, but we have two distinct types of species. The case selected species, that's us, elephants, things like that. Slow growth uh, and all those sort of characteristics um, about them that you can find on the slides, but aren't super duper important for this exam. And then we have our, our selected species, fast growth, really characteristic of things like mice or potentially the lionfish as we discussed today. So two distinct types of species that I would recommend that you just become familiar with um, in terms of what differentiates them. And again, what really differentiates them is just how fast they grow. R selected is fast, K selected is slow. It's really the sort of the fast, easiest way to remember that. The elephant versus the, the mouse, right? That's the, that's the way I've, I've remembered that for 10 years. And I think it's a pretty good way of remembering that. Um, and then we sort of talked about this issue of overshooting and crashing. Now we talked about it with a pretty cool example, at least in my opinion, of the reindeer on St. Matthew's Island. But our selected species can pretty easily, with their rapid growth, overshoot their carrying capacity, run out of resources, crash in population, and then rebound relatively rapidly. So we see this relatively commonly with our selected species, overshooting, crashing, overshooting, crashing, um, pretty dang common for our selected species, not very common for case selected species. Then we discussed, and you guys also created your own survivorship curves and for your cemetery data, uh, where we have three distinct types of survivorship curves. And remember what matters for these curves is how to read them, right? I don't care that you know that type one is for R selected or case selected or any selected species, right? I 
just want to know that you can read them. That's what's most important for these curves. So type one, remember it's very low mortality early on in life, very high mortality late in life. So you, you, if you have type one, you're, you're likely to live to old age. And that's pretty, that's pretty easy to understand when you think about humans, right? Most of the average life expectancy of humans is in the 70s, right? Well, sometimes it's higher, but on average, it's in the 70s. Type two, well, if you're a lizard, it doesn't really matter when you're, you, you're equally as likely to die old or young. It doesn't really matter. Um, that's what type two looks like. Um, and then you have type three, which is um, would be pretty characteristic of things like mice. Those are selected species. High, high, high mortality early on. Very few individuals living late into life. You, know, um, you, you see very, very few old mice in nature. Most of the mice you see in nature are, are, um, are young. Um, Oh shoot! I um, um I, I I forgot to get rid of this slide. Um, you can ignore you can ignore these things just as an FYI. I'm, I I realize those are there and they're not supposed to be there. Um, anyways, we'll get to there in a second. Um, so we talked about the human population. We we add about uh, eighty five million per year. We're at about seven point five billion, uh, with a projection of close to ten billion by twenty fifty. With most most growth occurring in rapid, uh, slow growing. I'm sorry, low income countries in Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, uh, changes in population size globally, it's a balance between birth and deaths. Uh, but in, in, at the local level, it's a balance between birth, deaths, as well as immigration and migration as well. Um, you can ignore these couple slides. I was originally um, going to have these, but um, uh, uh, I was going to put these in um, to move. I was originally going to have this be part of the exam, but um, I realized that I didn't talk about these things. So. Uh, you can ignore slides 29 through 33, because or sorry, actually through 34, because um, we haven't talked about those yet. We will, but we haven't talked about them yet. So ignore ignore these slides. Um, they were they're from another part of class. We'll discuss later. I just completely forgot to remove them because I'm, I'm I'm stupid. But again, don't worry about these guys. 29 to 34, you don't need to worry about. Them. And so then we have the slides from today. Um, so but what biodiversity is, it exists at the three levels, ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity. Uh, biodiversity does underpin our ecosystem services, all of them. It doesn't matter, if, even if it's cultural services, a high biodiversity ecosystem is better for people to go hiking in. Um, because if you have high biodiversity, it means you have very, very little land use change, which means you have a healthy ecosystem, which means people want to walk in your ecosystem, right? Or go fishing or whatever. So biodiversity, we can't live without it. Huge amounts of economic value. Then we discuss where biodiversity is found. It's in hotspots, right? And hotspots have lots of biodiversity because of high amounts of endemism, i.e. species such as the Florida manatee, which are only found in one spot on the planet. And in the case of the Florida manatee, it's found only in our friends, down with our friends in Florida. Then we, we sort of looked at where biodiversity hotspots were. You guys had some fantastic ideas about where biodiversity can be found. Lots of warm places, lots of islands. Um, we find biodiversity mostly along the equator. So biodiversity is found everywhere, but has some hotspots in the, along the equator. Then we talked about the Endangered Species Act, <clears throat> how it's really, really great, uh, how many species have saved from extinction from it, but has been weakened through some extent, but is making a little bit of a comeback in now, nowadays um, under the current administration. I, I, I do hope um, that um, the current administration does beef back up the Endangered Species Act, because again, it is so, so good. 99% success rate is really, really good. Um, and as we've discussed, losing species is not worth saving a saving a logging company a few million dollars or, or a fossil fuel company a few million dollars. It's just... It's just not even close. So, um, and then we talked about how to reduce biodiversity hotspots. Hot we talked about you know zoos and aquariums and enforcing laws in the book, protecting species. Um, but we also talked about um, E.O. Wilson's half Earth, protecting about half the the planet. Again, not like dividing the planet in half, sort of thing, as this quote tells you, but really protecting what we have, protecting our biodiversity, which in turn pr protects our ecosystems, which in turn protects the services, which in turn protects all the dollar dollar bills we derive from our healthy ecosystems. Because remember, a degraded ecosystem is not super value, right? The the shrimp farm, not very valuable. It's a net loss. But the the healthy mangrove down the coastline, 
super valuable, even if we're not directly taking money from the ecosystem by selling timber or selling fish or something like that. So those are the key points for today's, or I'm sorry, uh, next week's exam. Um, again, what you'll, what you'll see in this are, will simply be what's in these slides, what we covered today. Again, ignore these, these uh, five slides or so. Again, I just, in my brain, I thought I was gonna cover these. We, these are gonna be on the exam, but I'm, I'm, I just made a mistake. They're not on the exam at all. So you don't need to worry about them at all. So just as an FYI. But um, those are the sort of the key takeaways. Now, this little review session, you'll have, um, I'll post the recording to Blackboard um, later this afternoon. I think I'm a little bit behind on posting the recordings as well. Um, so I will post those today. I, I do promise that. Um, it's just a pain in the butt to upload things to Blackboard. The videos, they take forever. Like sometimes it takes like 30 minutes to upload a video. And it's not because of the internet, it's because of Blackboard's stupidity. So. Um, so you will have this recording for yourself. Um, so, you know, and you'll have the slide. So don't worry too much. Um, you'll have all this material for you. In terms of the exam, you'll have all the materials at your side. So I anticipate the exam to be, you know, have some difficulty to it, but also like, you know, I don't want you to be super stressed about it. Feel free to reach out to me if you need any help um, or you want to talk on Zoom, whatever, just let me know. Um, but again, what we covered today, the points I made today, the slides we covered today, that's what you really need to know. So don't worry about learning everything in the world. Just learn what I told you to learn today and you'll be a okay. So I'm gonna stop recording.